Well, hello, and welcome to another talk in the series of the core concepts of teaching and learning. I'm Elizabeth Breen. My co-partner, Stan Ashley, who you'll be hearing from shortly, we're going to spend some time today talking with you about assessing and evaluating the learn. So the first question I want to bring up is why do we assess learners? What's the point? I mean, it seems to take a lot of time and a lot of effort, and what are we doing it for? I feel like there's three basic reasons that are highlighted in the literature in terms of why we assess learners. First of all, obviously, we think it promotes learning. We, me uh, we learn what we measure, and it drives performance. We try to give the learners themselves lots of feedback, um, and we feel this is a pretty effective tool. Another reason to assess learners is to assess their competency. There's a lot of interest in regulation and certification of learners, uh, and this is something that gets done through assessment as well. This is where we decide whether someone's ready to move on to the next level of training or be certified to perform a clinical activity. The last reason that we think about in terms of assessing learners is to actually evaluate the teaching. If the learners aren't learning what we're assessing, then maybe we need to look back at the teaching and the curriculum design. So all in all, there's many reasons to assess learners. Next question that we want to ask is, what is it that we're assessing? So I think it's important to think about an entire curriculum when we think about assessing learners. So I think what we're mostly interested in here is thinking about the goals and the objectives. Assessment really should be based on what the goals and the objectives of the curriculum are. This schematic here shows an overall idea of what goes, all the elements that go into a curriculum, including the needs that set the goals, you then have your instructional methods, teaching and learning happens, and then again, that assessment goes back and resets the needs and also, as we mentioned before, assesses the curriculum. I want to spend a couple minutes here talking about some basic concepts that show up when we talk about assessment. These concepts are important and they show up over and over again. We'll spend a little bit of time talking about what we mean when we talk about formative versus summative assessment, what's normative versus criterion-based assessment, what are some of the attributes that get talked about a lot with regards to assessment, such as validity, reliability, feasibility. Well, other concepts that show up often are qualitative assessment versus quantitative, developmentally appropriate assessment, and what happens when, when students or learners fail and need remediation. So the first concept I want to talk about a little bit here is formative versus summative. This can sometimes be a little bit tricky. Formative assessment is basically what's used to improve learning. It should be continuous. It should be non-evaluative in terms of a grade. The students and trainees should respond to the assessment. Often examples that we use here are descriptive feedback or things like peer assessment. Formative assessment is in contrast to summative assessment which tends to be periodic, and this is the one that's used to document achievement. So this would be something that you would find certifying, or a grade, or a board exam, something like this. It's not unusual, particularly in a very complex learning environment, for people to say a feedback is formative because it gives the student immediate feedback or detailed feedback, but yet it's used again at the end of the clerkship to grade the student, in which case it's just become summative and it was no longer formative. This happens a lot in complex environments because the resources can be limited and a lot of work goes into any assessment tool that's developed. So if a formative assessment tool turns out to be great and very useful and very accurate, there's a strong temptation to use it again as a summative tool at the end. And this negates its ability to be formative to begin with, something that's important to keep in mind when you're thinking about assessing learners. The next thing I want to talk about uh, is normative versus criterion-based assessment. Uh, people talk about grading on a curve or having a certain percentage of students that receive one grade versus another grade, and this is normative-based assessment. This has started to become very unpopular in the world of medical learning uh, and assessment, uh, and criterion-based has started to become more and more important and more and more desired. All groups are looking at ways to improve their criterion-based assessment. My partner, Stan Ashley, is going to spend a couple of minutes now talking to you about the efforts that the ACGME has made in trying to create criterion-based assessments for resident training. So the milestones really are Tom Naska, the CEO of ACGME's concept of phase two of the competencies. In terms of the discussion today of principles of assessment, the milestones illustrate the differences between normative and criterion-based methods. Simply put, normative assessment compares an individual's performance with that of a group of people performing similar tasks, like the SAT, MCATs, USMLE. How one does depends on the curve. 
at least through medical school, most of us were assessed mainly using normative-based tools. And we continue to be with certification and recertification in exams. In contrast, criterion-based assessment compares an individual's performance to a predetermined standard that is usually established to guarantee competence at its final, as its final step. It is a minimum. So the Milestones Project is based on this criterion concept. Like the Dreyfus model, residents should improve in each of the ACGME general competency domains across residency and by the end achieve a level of proficiency such that they are safe to enter independent practice. That doesn't mean they're masters. Uh, I think everybody agrees that that goes on for quite a long time in practice. The milestones concept is that we can establish steps that can be used to track appropriate progress through residency. This was really new territory for the ACGME, which has always been about accrediting programs. The boards certify individuals, but NASCA's concept was that if programs were doing this for all their residents, and this was used to establish national norms, this could be used for accreditation. If a program's residents were making appropriate progress in their milestones, there was no need for the traditional site visits and all the other stuff that the ACGME does to accredit programs. The other part of this was, and he sold this on this, was it was a way to get into competence-based training as opposed to time. If you met your milestones, you could progress faster than uh, normally, and if you didn't, it might even take longer. This was a great concept, but when they put a group of us together to develop milestones for general surgery, it really hard to get your head around what the milestones should be for all surgery residents in communication alone in each of the competencies. So instead, we tried to work with something we call practice domains, and these are very similar to what you'll hear about from Lisa in terms of EPAs, entrustable professional activities, but for us they were kind of what a surgeon does. Surgeon treats diseases, they do operations, they do consults, they coordinate care, they educate. We came up with nine such things. And if you look at any one of these practice domains, it's made up of several competencies. So then we took each domain and tried to identify what the milestones were for each competency in that domain. These are the nine, treat diseases, perform operations, consult, coordinate care, engage in learning, improve care, educate, maintain personal health, do administrative tasks. So this is an example of the care for diseases and conditions domain, and it's just the medical knowledge competence. So then there are a series of milestones in this. The first one is for the domain at the beginning of residency, what you ought to have as a medical student. A beginning resident should have a basic knowledge of the signs, symptoms, and treatment of common surgical conditions. This progresses through to the senior resident who, in addition to the characteristics before that, have a greater knowledge of the diseases and conditions, et cetera, that are defined in SCORE, which is a basic surgical curriculum. At least the concept was that for each rotation, the resident would get an evaluation for each domain for each of the competencies that are relevant to it. And they might progress in some areas faster than others, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, 24 different points for each evaluation, so a ton of work for who's ever doing this. After each rotation, the global evaluation form that included all those things would be tabulated by a competency committee. And I think it is mostly working this way in surgery at the Brigham now. And then they would together synthesize each of the global evaluations, establish where that resident is in terms of the milestones in each area, give feedback to that resident, and send it on to the ACGME who would compile these things. Virtually every specialty is doing this now, where some of the specialties are about to move to Milestones 
There has been some enthusiasm and a ton of criticism. This is from a recent paper by Eric Holmbo, who oversees this at ACGME, summarizing the positives on the left, the negatives on the right. And the negatives list is considerably longer. I'm not going to go through all this. Uh, ACGME did acknowledge very early on that they could not use this to judge programs or ch ch change progression because nobody re would report accurately and it would uh, lose its utility. So they are just collecting data. They're not really doing anything specific with it. Um, I think everybody would say version 1.0 for every specialty has been much too long. Uh, there was a recent estimate that if members of the Internal Medicine Competency Committee really did their jobs and, and tried to get evaluate each of these competencies, it would take them about seven weeks a year. On the other hand, I think all would say it has been useful for identifying gaps in programs, both locally, uh, by looking at what the milestones should be and recognizing that people weren't teaching or assessing specific milestones, and nationally. So a good example is neurosurgery figured out that pretty much across the country, none of their residents were uh, reaching the competence level for pediatrics. And they had to make a decision about whether they were going to do something to beef it up or to eliminate that requirement. I think it also has helped residents to know the full range of what they are responsible for and to identify and for program directors to identify those that are having a problem and in what areas. ACGME remains fully committed to this, continues to collect data, and I don't think it's going to go away any time soon. As a segue to Lisa, I thought this was a good slide. shows you, so those practice domains are kind of like can make Italian food if you're a cook, which is comparable to these entrustable professional activities. Uh, the competencies for this are really fruit, vegetables, protein, and grain. And then the milestones uh, are those things that you do with these. Knows how to make sauce, knows how to dice tomatoes, et cetera, et cetera. A reasonable example of this. Thanks again. In a follow-up to what Dr. Ashley has just talked to you about, other organizations have been looking at criterion-based assessment. Another example we have here is the AAMC, which has come up with its Entrustable Professional Activities, often referred to as EPAs. After much work, they've come up with 13 activities which are described here. These activities are thought of as things that students should be able to do before they start their residencies. And you can see the domains are quite similar to other areas that often get assessed in medical learning. Can the student gather a history, perform a physical exam? Can they enter and discuss orders and prescriptions? Can they perform general procedures? Uh, can they recognize urgency? So how these have now been transferred into criterion-based assessments or an attempt at criterion-based assessments is each of these domains has been given three different categories. Is the learner pre-entrustable in these behaviors? Is the, are they emerging or are they entrustable? And it's careful to keep in mind here that they're entrustable at the student level, not at the physician level. And then each one of these domains has been delineated in a way that has what's hopefully very specific and very observable behaviors that move the learner from one category to the next. Here are some of the examples for gathering a history and performing a physical exam. And on this slide here, we have some examples on the goals of prioritizing a differential diagnosis. You can see here that in the pre-entrustable activities, the student can really only generate a couple of ideas for a diagnosis and they're largely using pattern recognition. Whereas when they're starting to emerge, the list might potentially become longer, but even more importantly, they're making these lists based on reasoning of pathophysiology and other sciences. And lastly, when they become entrustable, they're generating a thorough and an appropriate list, and they're really relying on pathophysiology, epidemiology, and other sciences to generate this list. Another concept I want to move on to talk about is some of the terms that are used when we talk about assessment tools and how useful they are. It's hard to talk about assessment without talking about its validity, reliability, and feasibility. Validity is what does the test measure what it's supposed to measure. And this can be broken down into many types of validity, which I've listed here. Reliability is does the test, is the test reproducible? If you gave that same test to that same learner over and over again, would they get the same results? 
And lastly, and what's often underestimated, again, in the complex clinical environment, is the feasibility. Are these tools actually practical? The clinical environment is very complex. People are often achieving more than one goal at any one time. And so are these tools cost effective? Do they take up a lot of time? And almost more importantly, how much faculty development is required in order to make these tools useful? Do you need dedicated faculty, or can the faculty be doing what they're doing in the workplace otherwise? Moving on now to choosing a tool. Just to review again, we said the tool should be based on the objectives that you're trying to measure. And then some of those objectives lend themselves, or some of those Miller's Triangle activities lend themselves to different tools, which we'll talk about more in a minute. And then think again about the strengths and weaknesses of your tool, the reliability, the validity, the practicality. On the next two slides, there's a list of some of the more common assessment tools used in medical education and the advantages and disadvantages that have been described. So the National Board of Medical Exam has an MBME subject exam, which is a written test, multiple choice. It seems to be a good test in terms of funds of fund of knowledge, but there's really no correlation to clinical skills. And over the course of the year, depending on what order students learn material, there might be some seasonal variation to their performance. Oral examinations are another tool. They seem to be good for fund of knowledge, seeing if the student can gather data and manage problems, but they do often set up in a situation where the students have a lot of anxiety and maybe won't be performing their best, or the examiner may have bias. Global assessments are very common, and this is when a global assessment is made of a student or a learner's performance over a period of time. It's a good tool because it's actually reflecting on real performance and often allows descriptive commentary, but it does rely on an aggregation of observations. It's subjective, um, and it's often remote. Two other tools that I'll highlight here, one is the OSCE, which has also become very popular and is now starting to become part of the National Board exam. Again, trying to look at real clinical skills, real communication, and personal skills. This test, however, can often be exceedingly time and resource intensive. Standardized patients have to be gathered, cases have to be written, examiners have to be recruited. And the situations aren't real, so how effectively can you actually simulate some of the real physical exam findings uh, that, or other findings that are important when the students are learning? The next test is the mini clinical evaluation exercise referred to as the mini CEX. This is somewhat similar to the OSCE in that it's a limited test of a clinical experience, but this time the clinical experience is real. Uh, the goal is to keep this exercise very short based on a very brief clinical encounter. But unfortunately, it does require a lot of scheduling coordination and probably several exercises need to be observed because the complexity of a real patient encounter might make the reliability harder to assess. So I'm going to spend the next couple of minutes here talking about the journey that we've taken with our learners and some of the assessment tools we've chosen and why. I'm going to talk again a little bit about the mini CEX tool. Here at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, all of our students spend their principal clinical year, which is their core clinical clerkships, all together with the Brigham. And as a group, the Brigham clerkship directors all committed to the idea that they would perform a mini CEX for all students in every clerkship. So we have a lot of experience with this. This is the form that's been validated in the past uh, based on um, internal medicine residents who perform mini CEX examinations in the course of their residency. So you can see again, the domains, interviewing skills, physical exam skills, professionalism, are very similar to the domains in many other clinical assessment tools. This time what happens is a trained observer watches the student perform a clinical encounter for 15 minutes and then spends 15 minutes going over feedback in terms of how the student did on each of these domains. We were able to go back and look at our results of the assessments that students received following the mini-CEX, and we actually compared them to the assessments they received on their global assessments after several weeks working with the same examiners. And what you can see here is the number of comments that show up on the mini-CEX are significantly more than show up on a global assessment. The number of domains or themes that are addressed are much higher than the number that show up on the global assessments. And perhaps what's even more interesting is that in the course of the mini CEX, although while many positive comments and positive feedback are given, there's also a large number of constructive or negative comments that are given to the learner. This is almost not existent with global assessments. It appears on global assessments it's very rare to give the student negative or constructive feedback. I know anecdotally there's many of our uh, faculty have said that they're reluctant to write negative things on a global assessment when they're not quite sure uh, where that will go or how important that will be to the student, whereas they're much more generous with their negative and constructive comments when it's a one-time clinical encounter that they're observing. So here's an example of some of the comments that are made uh, based on these various domains, which are here to read at your leisure. Students and faculty were also asked for qualitative feedback in terms of what they thought of the mini CEX experience. And you can see here that it was very popular. 
for both students, but also for faculty members. So our, our, in summary, our conclusion is that the Mini-CX is a very, very, very useful assessment tool for our student learners, and so we've kept on with this. It was very interesting, however, when we tried to take this Mini-CEX um, out of the post-operative rounding environment where we were largely using it and tried to use it in the clinic situation. We thought we had done a good job training our faculty with faculty development in terms of how the Mini-CEX worked, um, but we seemed to be unable to get Mini-CEXs performed in the clinic setting um, between faculty and students. It just seemed too much of a challenge. When we were thinking about this, we were wondering why faculty were willing to give us time to do oral examinations where they had to stop what they were doing clinically and spend time focused only on the student, whereas they had much, so much trouble performing an assessment tool that could happen while they were actually seeing patients in clinic at the same time. And we thought this was largely due to faculty development. All of our faculty are very familiar with oral examinations, as many have taken one, if not two, in their own board certification process, and many also administer these exams to board certified residents. So it took very little faculty development for us to tell faculty what was required on an oral exam, and so hence we had a high rate of performance of these oral examinations. So we decided to think a little bit more about the oral exam. What is it that's useful in terms of the faculty, uh, in terms of the student learning? What are the faculty reflecting on that's very useful to the students? And so we went back over uh, and we looked at five years worth of oral examination scores and comments and started to look at what was really important. And it turned out that faculty were reflecting on not only the knowledge and skills, but they spent a lot of time reflecting on the students' thought process and their clinical thinking ability, and also some time thinking about their communication skills and their professionalism. So we used this analysis to develop a new oral exam assessment guide. The oral examination assessment guide is given to the faculty, and it often starts off with a very brief case, such as this one at the top, and then some prompters for the faculty on items that the student may discuss, both with data gathering, analysis, and management. And then there's a segment that again talks about whether the student has knowledge and they can apply that knowledge. But there's two other sections which seem to be very important. One is, is that we ask the examiner to reflect on the student's cognitive process. What pace is the student working at? This is a little bit like the Goldilocks principle. Faculty seem to highlight very quickly when a student is going far too slowly through a case, hesitating and stalling. And they also make a lot of comments when the student goes far too quickly through a case, again relying on pattern recognition rather than thinking through something. They also are asked to comment on the student's thoroughness and focus and decisiveness, which tends to be another big decision, another big measure of their cognitive process. We also ask the faculty to think about the student's critical thinking ability. This is often highlighted when at the end of the case, the faculty member asks, changes one of the variables and then asks the student, what would you do now if this variable existed? This tends to cancel out that students have been using pattern recognition and highlights the, the skills of the student who is able to go back and rethink through the problem if some of the variables have changed. The last assessment tool I'm going to talk a little bit about today is one that we've just started experimenting with in our clerkship, which is peer assessment. We wanted to try to engage the students more, invest them in their own learning, help them to understand the process that goes into evaluation, and we wanted to use some formative tools that we would not be tempted to use as summative tools at the end. We started off with a questionnaire just merely asking the students what they would think of peer assessment. What do they think of the advantages, the disadvantages, would they be willing to engage? Um, and what we found is that some students were very positive. They thought it would give them a different perspective from people already evaluating them. Uh, they thought it would improve their ability to give feedback, which they see as important. Um, and they thought it would incentivize professionalism among students. Some, however, reflected on the biases that students might have about each other with prior interactions uh, or lack of training uh, or observation amongst each other. So in this survey, you can see the results were very much middle of the road, whether or not the students would like to receive feedback or be willing to give feedback in a one to five score. We went ahead and asked them to do it anyway, although we kept it very blinded. We never knew who was giving what feedback to which student, but we were interested in what the results would look like. We used those same domains that showed up in multiple other assessment tools, uh, and then we asked the students to give and receive feedback at week six and week 12 of a 12 week clerkship. And so not surprisingly here, in the areas that students felt most comfortable with were professionalism and communication, and the areas they felt least comfortable with were, were technical skills, and even some areas around fund of knowledge and data gathering skills, despite the fact that they're often observing each other, gathering information, and presenting patients to one another and faculty. And so this is just a summary of those results. They were most confident with interpersonal skills um, and professionalism, um, and least confident with technical skills. One of the things that was interesting is they tended to have a little bit of grade inflation, which is not all that surprising. Students tended to score each other in a four or five out of a one to five Likert scale. So all in all, our work so far in peer assessment is that it could potentially be valuable. It might capture a different viewpoint, uh, and it might give us a true formative assessment tool, but that it might be limited with the attributes that we can actually ask peers to assess, uh, and it might really be uncomfortable in some cultures.
So all in all, after our talk today, I was hoping that you, some of the take-home points that you have is that you've thought a little bit more about what the purpose of assessment is, uh, some of the key issues and concepts that are wrapped up in the ideas of assessment, some examples of tools that we use, and some of the challenges.